Hello everyone. Welcome back to the introduction to AVL software as part of the aerodynamics and performance. So before we moved into session two tutorial, I think it's important to discuss a little bit about the aircraft flight dynamics and stability. So we're going to look at flight dynamics and stability for aircraft in a brief introduction before we jump into the session two tutorial for AVL. So here we can see a series of equations. These are the general equation of motion for an aircraft. How they are derived is not the point or the scope or the focus of this presentation, but rather we want to see that we do have these 12 equations. Now these 12 equations are basically, can be split into two parts, the dynamics and the kinematics. So the kinematics for the aircraft are the position rates and the Euler angles. So how or where the aircraft is positioned with X, Y, Z and how it's oriented with phi, theta and psi. So these are the positions, these are the angles. We additionally have the dynamics, which includes the linear momentums and the angular momentums. So the X, Y, Z forces and the L, M and N moments. So these 12 equations describe or can be used to describe a motion for an aircraft using all the parameters that are included from the characteristic of the aircraft that you are dealing with. Now, if we divide the following equations that are the forces or momentums or linear momentums by one over M and multiply the moment equations L, M and N by I, which is the identity minus one, we obtain the explicit expressions for the linear u dot, v dot, and w dot, which are the time derivatives of x, y, and z direction velocities, or linear velocities, and the angular velocities that are the p dot, q dot, and r dot. Again, the dot notation shows the time derivative of a particular variable. p and q and r are in order rotations about x, y, and z axes. So all the 12 equations will then collectively have the classical state space form. So when you're describing an equation or the equations of motion for a system, the classical state space form is of x dot equals f of x and delta. In this case, x are the states of your system. So all the parameters that you can describe what is the current state of your system or the state of your system at any given time, which are the time derivatives. As you can see, we have them with a dot notation as a function of X, which are those same states, but not the time derivative and Delta, which is the input to your system. So in this case, these could be for an aircraft, the control inputs that you have through the control surfaces for an aircraft. Since the full equations of motion are highly nonlinear and not tractable to understand and use in all cases, and because the linear forms can, to a reasonable extent, provide the required results, we can linearize these equations as follows. So we looked at the full nonlinear equations, the 12 equations we looked at earlier, but Mostly, they can be difficult to work with, especially if you're a beginner and you're starting to learn how these equations work. So what we try to do is we try to simplify those equations. We are limiting ourselves in what we can do with the simplified equations, but at least we do have simpler equations to work with. The process of simplifying those equations or linearizing those equations for a certain operating range that we call here the trim state will help us get rid of some of the terms in those equations 
and simplify the remaining terms that will make life easier for us to work with the linearized or the simplified equations. To do that, we first assume that the trim state with x0 or x0 and delta 0, so the index 0 for x, which are the states, and delta, which are the control inputs, shows the trim state or the equilibrium state, where x0 or x0 dot is equal to 0. So at the trim state, you will have the time derivative of your states equal to 0. So if you put x0 and delta0 or x0 and delta0 into the classical state space form, you should get the x0 dot equal to 0, except for the position rates and heading rate as follow. So in that moment, you still have these states as non-zero because they are showing the movement of your aircraft without any drastic changes. So you will have x dot, y dot, z dot, which are the velocities in x, y, and z direction, plus the psi dot, which is the yaw angle or the heading angle for your aircraft to be non-zero. This allows for both straight flights where r0 is 0 from PQR and the steady turning flight where r0 is not 0. Now let's consider small perturbations such as delta x of t and delta delta of t about the trim state as shown below. So in this picture, or this figure, you see, you see that you have an aircraft flying at this initial perturbation, and the actual state at any point is equal to the trim state that is x0 or x0 plus delta x. This delta x is the later perturbation. So if there was no change or perturbation in the aircraft behavior or state, it would continue on this straight line that we show as the trim state with x0 or x0. However, if there are small changes, they can affect the trajectory on which the aircraft is actually flying. And because of that, it will deviate or move away from the trim state and it can end up somewhere here, which basically is whatever the trim state was plus some perturbation or some small changes from that which can be shown by this capital Delta X. So with this formulation, at any point, we can write the actual state of the system as X of T to be the summation of the trim state plus the Delta X, which is the perturbation. And the same for the Delta, which is the input for the system or aircraft as the trim state controls plus the perturbations in controls. From before, if we put these equations back in the full state space equation, which we had as x naught equals x dot equals f of x and delta, and now we replace the x and delta with the summation of the trim state plus perturbation, we end up getting these equations that x naught dot plus delta x dot equals f of x naught plus delta x and delta naught plus delta delta. And this is where the approximation comes in and we need to have a small perturbations for it to be applicable. So remember the perturbations are small changes. If the changes are not a small enough, these won't be applicable. This means that the left-hand side of this equation is equal to the first term of the Taylor series expansion about the trim state. And this will only apply, so we can use the Taylor series expansion if these changes are small. So that's why we need them to be small to be able to continue with our linearization or the simplification process. So if you look at the Taylor series expansion, we have the left-hand side as x0 dot plus delta x0 equals f of x0 and delta0 plus 
the first derivative of f with respect to x evaluated in x naught and delta dot multiplied by delta x plus the first derivative of f with respect to delta evaluated in the trim state x naught and delta naught multiplied by delta delta. So this is the left hand side of this term equaling the first term in the Taylor series expansion about the trim state. Now the trim state is a physical state itself. That means that it must obey the laws of motion. That is, the x naught dot should be equal to the f of x naught and delta naught. Which means that the delta x naught is going to be equal to a matrix, we show it by a matrix, multiplied by delta x plus another matrix, which show it by B matrix, multiplied by delta delta, where the matrix A is the first derivative of F with respect to X evaluated at the trim state, and matrix B is going to be first derivative of F with respect to delta evaluated at the trim state. So these two matrices, the matrices A and B, are called the system's Jacobian matrices. So the Jacobian matrices are basically partial derivative matrices. Because if you see, we actually have the definition of A and B as the derivatives evaluated at the trim state. These elements, or the elements of the A and B matrices, are dependent on the specifics of the trim state as the derivatives are taken at the trim state. So we take the derivatives and we evaluate them at the trim state. So the actual values in those matrices or the elements of the A and B matrices depend on the value or the state of the trim that you are calculating or linearizing your system about. So in the case where there is no control perturbations such that the delta delta is equal to zero, so you're not really touching the controls in your aircraft, the system is assumed to be in the fixed stick state. In this state, we set the controls for the trim state and we do not touch them after that. Now, what is this useful for? In this case, the natural response of the aircraft can be obtained and it is used to assess the stability of the aircraft. So when we are dealing with the fixed state, we can assess the stability of the aircraft. And this is showing us the natural response of the aircraft. The general solution of the linear time invariant or LTI ordinary differential equation or ODE system can that is described as delta x dot equals a delta x plus b delta delta. So this is an ODE and we are looking for a solution of this LTE because what we want is we want x or delta x as a function of time, which basically tells us at any given time what will be the values for each state or each variable of our system that defines the state of our system or how it is behaving at that particular moment. So the solution of this equation that we just found, which is a linear form of the full nonlinear equations for our system, is a superposition of eight flight dynamics eigenmodes. So when we get to AVL and we try to run some stability analyses, we will end up with some stability derivatives and we will also end up with some flight dynamics modes. Those modes are the ones we are referring to here and that's why this review is important to understand where those terms come from and when we're looking at some of those stability analyses with AVL, where are they stemming from, where are they derived from, and what they mean and what we are looking at. So this superposition, so this is delta x as a function of time, this is what we were looking for, is a summation of one to eight, so eight modes that we call eigenmodes. So these eigenmodes have the eigenvector vk and an exponential 
that has the lambda or the eigenvalue multiplied by time. And the lambda itself, the eigenvalue, has a real part that is sigma and an imaginary part that is omega. So it is a complex number. A lambda in general or the eigenvalue in general is a complex number that has a real part and an imaginary part. But it can be missing either or depending on the state of your system. Where lambda 1 to 8 are the non-zero eigenvalues and v1 to 8 are the corresponding eigenvectors of the Jacobian matrix A. Now the question is, we have actually 12 equations. Why do we only have eight states or eigenmodes that we are superimposing or summing up for the full state of the system? The other four non-zero eigenvalues correspond to a shift in x, y, z, and psi. If you remember, we said at the trim state, all the x dots need to be zero except for these in the aircraft system. And we discussed because your airplane should actually be moving or could be moving while it is in the trim state. They don't have to be zero. They just don't have to have change which has no influence on the dynamics and therefore is excluded from the mode summation. So if we remove these four modes from the 12 modes, we end up with only eight modes that are affecting the actual state of the system. And that is how we can find the delta x as a function of time for our linearized system. The magnitude of each omega, so the omega was the imaginary portion of lambda, which was our eigenvalue, and the sign and magnitude of sigma, which was the real part of the eigenvalues, indicate the nature of each mode that we are dealing with. Now the question is, what does each one sign and magnitude tell us? So if omega is zero, this is the complex portion of the complex number, the imaginary portion of a complex number, then that means the motion we have is monotonic, which means it's not oscillating. The system is not oscillating. If omega is not zero, that means you have an oscillatory system. And if your sigma or a real part of the eigenvalue is greater than zero or is positive, then your mode is not stable. And if it's negative, then your system is stable. And if it is zero or very close to zero, it is marginally stable. So your system can be on the verge of divergence at any point. Now, how do we find those eigenvalues, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors? So for the linear equation, we have ax equals b that come from steady state problems. Eigenvalues have their greatest importance in the dynamics problem. So if we have a derivative with respect to time, so du dt equals a, a matrix multiplied by u, which looks very similar to what we have for x dot equals ax plus bu, or b delta, is changing with time. So the response is either growing or decaying or oscillating, depending on the signs that we just discussed. We can't find it by elimination. However, we can use a v equals lambda v, so the eigenvalue equation, to be able to solve for the lambdas or the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So the basic equation in here is A v equals lambda v, where the lambda is the eigenvalue of A. Now how do we find the eigenvalues of A or lambdas? To find lambdas, we need to solve the determinant of lambda the determinant of matrix A minus lambda i, so lambda are the eigenvalues that are unknown, A is known from our system, and i is just the identity matrix with the same size as A. If we solve this equation, or this set of equations, this, this determinant equal to zero, we will end up with a system of equations with the only unknowns as lambdas, and that should give us the lambdas or the eigenvalues for a system with the Jacobian matrix A. The eigenvalue lambda tells whether the special vector x is stretched or shrunk or reversed or left unchanged when it is multiplied by A. So for each lambda we solve 
la a minus lambda i times v equal to zero or a v equals lambda v to find the eigenvectors. So we have two things, the eigenvalues that are lambdas and the eigenvectors that are v's. Now we go back to the eigenmode analysis where we said the solution, the delta xt, was actually equal to the summation of eight modes. Now these v's should be familiar, they are the eigenvectors now, and these lambdas are the eigenvalues. So the lambda 1 to 8 are the non-zero eigenvalues and v1 to 8 are the corresponding eigenvectors of the Jacobian matrix A. And we said that the magnitude of each omega and the sign and magnitude of each sigma indicates the nature of that mode. If omega is 0, then the motion is monotonic, so it's non-oscillatory. If omega is not 0, then the motion is oscillatory. And if sigma is positive, then the mode is divergent. And if the sigma is negative, then the mode is stable or convergent. So in the original equation of motion, the linearized equations are nearly full, meaning that you have all the elements as non-zero elements. So that means the elements of A and B matrices have non-zero elements. However, we can have further assumptions or add further assumptions to our problem to eliminate or remove some of those non-zero elements and make them zero in the A and B matrices. That will help us further simplify our problem. So these assumptions include geometric symmetry, meaning that the airplane is left-right symmetric, aerodynamic symmetry, which means that V0 equals P0 equals R0 equals Phi0 equals zero, and negligible onboard angular momentum, meaning you don't have additional momentum from any of your onboard components acting on your system. So the only momentum are from the actual system itself, there's no additional momentum. So in these cases, or with these extra assumptions, we can further simplify the A and B matrices, which will be shown in this form. So we will have D x with respect to time or x or delta x dot equals this will be our a matrix delta x plus this will be our b matrix plus or times delta so this should be a times not a plus so in this case we will have we can actually divide this matrix to three portions. So the first four rows will give us the longitudinal dynamics. The second four rows will give us the lateral dynamics. And the last four rows will give us the navigational subset. And in these A and B matrices, you see that some of these portions are left without any dots. So these dots mean that they are non-zero elements. And wherever we don't have those dots, meaning that those are zero elements or there is no elements in those. So basically we have uh, zero values and that when we have those zero values, our overall equations are much simpler to work with because a lot of these terms are eliminated. And that is after the linearization and the extra assumption we put on our problems. But these full set of equations for the aircraft we have can be divided into three subsections for the longitudinal, lateral, and the navigational subsystems or modes for our aircraft. Now let's also discuss some static and dynamic stability for the aircraft. We will discuss the dynamic stability of aircraft. It tells us about how an aircraft responds after a disturbance to a steady flight condition. So if you remember, we said that we assume that we have a trim state for our aircraft, and if it is perturbed or moved from that path, it will, depending on whether it's stable or not, tend to go back to it and eliminate those perturbations or our unwanted motions. So that is when our system is stable. If it's not a stable, those perturbations or small movement can cause it to completely go off course and not continue on the path we had set for it to follow. 
More fundamental than the dynamic stability is the static stability, which means that there is an initial tendency for a body to return to equilibrium after being disturbed. A body can be statically stable without being dynamically stable. But to be dynamically stable, a body must be statically stable. So let's look at these diagrams that gives us examples of positive, neutral, and negative stability. So we have a cone here and we have a ball here. So for the cone, the left-hand side, for both of these examples, the left-hand side diagrams show a positive static stability, meaning that if we apply a force to these objects, whether it's a cone or the ball, or basically perturbing them, they will tend to move back to where they were. So if we try to move them, they will go back to where we originally moved them from. In, in the example of the aircraft, if we try to move it away from the trim state, it will try to go back to that trim state, and that is a positive static stability. We say that our system is statically stable. The middle diagrams show neutral static stability, meaning that the object we are dealing with doesn't really care about where it is being moved from because it is not going back to where it was or moving to a new location. As soon as you remove the force, it will remain where it is at that particular time. So that is called the neutral static stability. And the right-hand side, the last category, is the negative st static stability or static instability. In this case, or in these examples, if we try to push the objects a little bit, we see that they will not go back to where they were. And additionally, they will not remain where we removed the force. They will tend to get to an, a more stable position. So in this case, for the cone, it will just fall off and stabilize on the floor. And for this ball, it will run off this hill and it will end up somewhere that it can rest, but it will not definitely go back to, this, to the top of this hill and it will not stay where we remove the force. So these are examples of the static stability or initial tendency for an object to go back to where it was originally or its equilibrium point. So here we have an example of an aircraft with a static stability or initial tendency to go back to trim state. So the left-hand side, we see that you have more opaque object. And as we move to the right-hand side or moving through time, we see that the opacity is decreasing, meaning that they are later in time. So for the positive, we see that we start with some oscillations, but ending up with a stable position. And that means the tendency of this aircraft with positive aesthetic stability is to go to an equilibrium or trim state. With neutral, if we don't move it, it will just remain where it is. It don't change to any other location or position or state. And with negative stability or instability, we will get divergence. So if we move the aircraft a little bit, it will completely go off course and move to another state without tending to go back to something that is more stable or the trim state. Now, in the case of dynamic stability, the same concepts apply, but the tendency is over time. So you can see that over time, we have an aircraft with positive dynamic stability that tends to go to a trim state that is more stable. With neutral dynamic stability, we don't touch the aircraft and it stays as it is, no changes. And with negative dynamic stability or divergence, the aircraft starts having larger amplitude for oscillation, and that shows that the aircraft is diverging or moving completely off course from where it started with little changes in its course or little perturbations or little pushes. Now let's get to some definitions. First, let's discuss 
the center of pressure. The center of pressure is the point where the total sum of a pressure field acts on a body. In aerospace, this is the point on the airfoil or wing where the resultant vector of lift and drag forces acts. The pressure field changes with the angle of attack alpha. That means the center of pressure changes with the variations of alpha. So remember that the center of pressure is going to change with the changes in the angle of attack. And here we have a wing, we have the lift and drag for this wing, and we have the center of pressure. In the airplane's normal range of flight attitude, if the angle of attack is increased, the center of pressure moves forward. So in this case, so this was the neutral point that we looked at in the previous slide. So we had our center of pressure, and also we have a center of gravity because of the mass distribution for the wing. So normally, if you increase the angle of attack, the center of pressure will move forward. So you see that it is further forward compared to the neutral position. And if we reduce the angle of attack, the center of pressure moves backward, or in this case, closer to the center of gravity. As the center of gravity, which is the point where the weight of the body acts, is fixed because of the mass distribution, this movement of the center of pressure because of the change in the angle of attack affects the stability of the aircraft. Now, additionally, we have an aerodynamic center. Aerodynamic center is the resultant or the pressure of forces also cause a moment on the airfoil. So instead of, in addition to the lift and drag that are acting the central pressure, we have a moment that is acting on the airfoil as well. As the angle of attack or alpha increases, the pitching moment at a point, for example, the center of gravity, also changes. However, that moment or the pitching moment remains constant at the aerodynamic center. So the aerodynamic center is the location where the pitching moment for your airfoil does not change with the angle of attack. For symmetric airfoils in subsonic flights, the aerodynamic center is located approximately at one-fourth or 25% of the cord from the leading edge of the airfoil. The aerodynamic center does not change with variation in angle of attack. Therefore, the aerodynamic center, rather than the center of pressure, is used in the analysis of longitudinal stability because it is more independent of the angle of attack and can be more useful because of that in these analyses. Now let's look at a full airplane. So for this one, we have the wing, we have the horizontal stabilizer or the horizontal tail. So we, the wing itself has an aerodynamic center, the horizontal tail or stabilizer has an aerodynamic center and the lift for the wing is acting the here and the lift for the horizontal stabilizer is acting here. Now, both of these lift forces have an arm, which is the distance from the center of gravity. That distance multiplied by the force of lift creates the pitching moments. So for this case, for the lift, we see that that pitching moment is in the clockwise direction. And for the horizontal stabilizer, this is in the counterclockwise. And the center of gravity is also where the weight is acting. So the neutral point is the lift of the wing acting through the center of pressure is in front of the CG or center of gravity. This causes a destabilizing motion increase in lift due to increase in alpha that causes a nose up moment. Further increasing 
alpha. This is counteracted by the moment produced by the lift of the horizontal stabilizer acting behind the center of gravity. Now, as the center of gravity, which you can control with the distribution of mass in your aircraft, moves forward, the stability of the aircraft increases because the main wing lift arm is being reduced, so you have a smaller moment for the wing and a larger moment for the horizontal stabilizer, which will make the aircraft statically stable. However, as the center of gravity moves backward, the main wing lift moment arm increases. So the blue moment is increasing and the aircraft stability decreases. In this case, the aircraft is said to be statically unstable. As the aircraft is stable when the center of gravity is in the nose and unstable when the center of gravity is in the tail, there is a position in the middle where the aircraft is neither stable nor unstable. That is, the stability is neutral. This point is called the neutral point. So the neutral point is fixed for a particular aerodynamic configuration of the aircraft. Now, looking at this diagram, the assessment for stability means analyzing response to alpha or angle of attack disturbances or perturbations or small changes. At equilibrium, we must have the moment about center of mass or center of gravity to be zero. Note that the positive direction for aircraft pitching moment or CMCG is clockwise. If, for example, we perturb alpha up, so we have a nose up, we must have a restoring moment to push the nose back down, which requires the moment to be negative, considering that by definition, the pitching moment is positive in the clockwise. This means that we need CM to be zero at equilibrium, or the moment should be zero at equilibrium. And we also need the derivative or the rate of change of the moment with the change of angle of attack, which can be shown as one of the stability derivatives, CM alpha, the rate of change of M or pitching moment with alpha angle of attack to be negative. This condition also requires CM, given the angle of attack where lift is zero, to be positive. The condition on the slope of the moment of coefficient can also be more usefully written as we want the rate of change of pitching moment with respect to the rate of change of lift or lift coefficient to be negative. Now think about this case. Let's say we have two different aircrafts. This diagram is showing the pitching moment with respect to alpha changes. We have two airplanes. Airplane one has this decreasing slope for the rate of change of CM with respect to alpha. And we have airplane two that has the increasing trend of CM as the alpha increases. And we have two, three points, A, B, C, and B is where CM with respect to alpha is zero. So we have zero pitching moment, which is one of the conditions for equilibrium that we saw earlier. Now, considering the rate of change of CM with alpha or angle of attack, which aircraft do you think is going to be stable and which aircraft do you think is going to be unstable? This is, an, this is a question I want you to think about and use the knowledge we have been reviewing in, this, in these slides and so far to be able to answer this question. Now, what are the consequences for the aircraft? Since the wing aerodynamic center is always roughly one fourth of a chord point, we use that as a reference location for the wing. The analysis gives us that 
aircraft center of mass or CG must normally be further back from nose of aircraft than the wing aerodynamic center. The fixed stick neutral point is the neutrally stable location of the center of gravity when elevator and other controls are held fixed. And for static stability, the CG must be in front of the fixed stick neutral point. Additionally, an aircraft must be statically stable as a precondition for dynamic stability, as we discussed earlier. From an approximate analysis, we get the bounds for the location of the aircraft center of mass for it to be stable stat statically. So for this, the center of mass must be behind wing aerodynamic center, and the center of mass must be ahead of the fixed stick neutral point. So the center of mass location can be determined by the mass distribution for the aircraft you're designing. We have the wing location and we know where the wing aerodynamic center is going to be. So we can find the aerodynamic center of the wing. We need to make sure that the center of gravity or center of mass for our aircraft is behind that wing aerodynamic center when we are designing our aircraft or its configuration to be able to have aesthetic stability for our aircraft. Additionally, we should be able to find the fixed stick neutral point with the definitions that we discussed and additional analysis that we can actually run in AVL to be able to find the fixed stick neutral point. And we need to make sure that the center of mass for the aircraft we're designing is ahead of that fixed stick neutral point, which then helps us. So if the center of mass is between these two points that we can define and design as we are changing the configurations for our aircraft, we can then be sure that the aircraft that we have designed or configured is statically stable. And additionally, we can run some analysis for the different modes of our aircraft to find its dynamic stability, as we discussed earlier, finding the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors that actually the AVL allows us or gives us some tools to run those analyses and get some results and gives us the tools and the results we need to analyze those modes to make a decision or conclusion based on all the data that we get to be able to discuss static and dynamic stability of the aircraft that we have designed. So now that we have run through this review of the material, some of it may be new, some of it may be something that you knew already, we can get to the session two tutorial that was provided in the AVL package that we then get to go through last time to be able to test some of these concepts at least at the basic level. So let's go back to AVL. So we are again in the AVL folder. We need to open session two. So we will have session two here. I'm going to just put it on the left hand side. And we need to go to runs. We need to run AVL. So we have the AVL again, and I'm going to pin this to the right. So we have them side by side. And we're going to go through these commands again. So this, this is the part that we discussed last time. And we're going to start with the actual commands that we need to execute to get some of these results. So it is asking us this time to load AVL BD. Uh, we discussed last time that because we're not running the command line, we are running from inside the AVL, we need to load these individually. So load mass, uh, load uh, AVL configuration file, mass file, and the run file separately. So we load BD, which will basically load BD.AVL. We said AVL is optional for the configuration file. So it successfully loaded it. We had it loaded and we see some of the results. We additionally need to load mass. So we have mass BD.mass. 
we see that we successfully have the mass file loaded and we can see some of the mass and inertia information here as well. So in here with the mass distribution we have, you can see that the location of the center of gravity in terms of x, y, z are where and we also see some of the inertia matrices that are required for some of the calculations in the full equations of motion that we looked at that will actually be used by AVL to run these analyses. And finally, for the third item, so we did the load the configuration file, we did the mass file, and we need to run the case file. So let's see if we have any case file. So we need to use case bd.run. So there are seven cases for this configuration. So we were successfully able to load the configuration, which is bd.avl. We were able to load the mass file, which was mass bd. And finally, we were able to run the run cases with case bd.run. So we have everything loaded for this aircraft. Now we can get into the commands that are listed in this session two tutorial. So it is asking us now to say, go into the operation mode. We enter upper. Then we want to select the run case five as our target. So we press five, enter. So the run case five is loaded. Now we press X to execute the calculations. The calculations are complete and we will need to look at the TREFS plane. So we press T and then enter and it loads for us the TREFS plane. So we see in the TREFS plane, we have the asymmetric loading from the yaw rate and the side slip. So we see that we have an asymmetric load distribution. This is because we do have a bank angle, which means that the aircraft is actually turning or rolling. And we also have a yaw rate that is not zero. And because of that, we have an asymmetric load distribution for this run case. Now to go back, it says return to operation menu. So we go back here, press enter. To go back to operation menu, press enter again to go to AVL menu. Now we get to the eigen mode analysis. So here, if you look, we says press mode to enter the eigen mode menu. So if we type mode, enter, we now enter the eigen mode menu. So again, we have some menu options. Um, the tutorial is telling us to go to new eigen calculation. So we type N, we go to eigen menu calculation, it runs some calculation and now it's asking us again to show to choose a command. So the next command is X for execute or examine the selected eigen mode. And what it does, it opens a new graph. So if we go to the graph, we see that we have seven different run cases for this and each of them are shown with different colors. And they also are giving us some of the basic parameters for our analysis that we can use for each run case. Additionally, what we see here is the imaginary plane or the complex plane, which on the X axis, we have the Sigma. So the real part and on the Y axis, we have Omega, which is the imaginary part. And we see that do you remember the eigenvalues that we said each eigenvalue has a real part shown with Sigma and an imaginary part that shows with omega. So on this axis, we see that for each run case that are separated by color, distinguished by different colors, we can see that the location of these are going to tell us whether or not that mode is stable or oscillatory. 
So we said if sigma was positive, then we would have an unstable motion. If it was negative, we would have a stable motion. So anything near zero for sigma is kind of marginally unstable or stable. And anything on the left-hand side or anything with negative sigma is a stable motion. Additionally, we have some modes or eigenvalues that have omega on as zero. So these modes are going to be non-oscillatory or monotonic motions. They will not oscillate. Whatever has a positive omega value, so these eigenvalues will represent the motions or modes that have oscillatory motion. So we can further examine these. Now, after we do that, we can see that after we press X, we see this figure. It says, examine a mode. To be able to examine a mode, we need to click on a fugoid root 7 above X axis close to Y axis. So fugoid mode is, one, is a name for one of the modes that we discussed. And if you want to know further about these, there's additional resources on the various modes for an aircraft, the different eight modes that we discussed, how you can look at them, what they mean. And I actually discussed this further in the aerodynamics and performance course. But for the sake of this, uh, just think of the fugoid mode or root as one of the different modes that we had for an aircraft and it says this mode is above the x-axis and it is close to the y-axis. Something that we see here is that in this figure it is a little bit crowded so one thing we can do that is not actually mentioned in this tutorial is if we go back here uh, there is an option here for blow up window. What blow up window will let us do is it will let us to zoom into a portion of this figure to be able to see the, the actual points better. So if we go here and we're going to press B and we're going to, so this is just selecting a mode. That is not what we want to do. We want to go back. So let's just go back. So we press space. So here we want to go blow up mode. So we go back to AVL. Then we go back to mode. And then we want to go to so here we are going to see this. So we have this mode. So once we select the mode, we are able to run through that mode in time. And these are the keys we can use. So if we press these keys, you see that we can see an animation that is basically showing the variation of the aircraft motion over time for that particular mode or eigenvalue that is representing that mode. And we have some other options that we can work with. And additionally, if we press zero, it will set the time back to zero. And to exit, we can press space. And we want to see the route map again. So to see the route map, we see P. So this is where we want it to go. So P, we want to route look at the roots and then we can use the blow up to zoom in because before we were in the examine mode if we clicked on the plot it would just show us but now we use the p command to just plot the root locus or 
the location of the eigenvalues for various run cases that we have. And next, if we press B, so to blow up window, we can go here and now we can select the top left first and then the bottom right next and it will zoom in for us on the root locus or the complex plane and now you see that we have a better resolution for what we are looking for and we can look at the eigenvalues in more details so if we want to zoom in further we can press B again we can go back here choose again the top left and the bottom right and we will see this in more detail and if we want to let's say this time select X examine the selected eigen mode so now we can click on a particular one because now we have them in more detail and now we can see the animations so as you see this is the fugoid mode that the airplane is basically going up and down in a circular or oscillatory motion and the animation is showing us that how it is behaving so the red one is the progression over time the white airplane is the time zero airplane mode and if you press zero we go back to time zero so now we're going to go back so we press space we go back the other things we can do are we can write the roots to a file so this will help us for additional analysis outside of AVL so if you want to run some coding or do some Excel analysis you can write all these eigenvalue information into a file and then look at them and extract them from that file and then you can uh, do what you need to further for further analysis but so we're going to skip this part we don't want to write that to a file yet and we have some additional uh, data here so we're going to say enter parameter modification so if you see here M is modify parameters we press M enter and we have various options so what we want to do is IX IX so we want to change that to 0.4 so we say IX IX 0.4 enter so we have ixx.4 then iz iz point 0.6 so we have iz iz set to point 0.6 and after that we want to press return or enter and now it says we want to do a new eigenvalue calculation and we want to toggle the data overlay with D so these data file overlay toggle maybe DIT And then we say plot so it cannot plot I think the reason we see this is because we did not save the file previously so if you actually follow this right root locus to file and then load that file after you change these properties what you should see is the overlay data from the default file name that you wrote earlier that we skipped and then add the initials mainly affected the dodge rule root so what you should see is two sets of data basically the two sets of eigenvalues on that complex plane or root locus plane that will show you 
how they changed when you change the parameters or modify the parameters of your system and what modes were affected by how much. So that is good for analysis if you were to run extra analysis there. And the last part is just going back to the AVL menu and then quitting AVL. So that will be the end of this session two tutorial with an overview of the concepts that were needed for this.